So the next speaker is Luis Lehner from Perimeter Institute. He will talk about black holes and consequences for gravity and fluid. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let me start by thanking the organizers for the invitation. And uh, as with Andrew, I will apologize for not being there. Um, lots of things got in the way. And in particular, apparently, uh, India and Canada are not very good friends these days. Hopefully, this is going to be changing anytime soon. Uh, that was only half a joke. Okay, so let me uh, let me get on with my talk. I mean, uh, you'll see where I'm coming. I mean, it's it's a very interesting topic. The, this one of the conference. I'm not sure I have a lot to say about turbulence, but I've been uh, thinking in the context of um, pot potential connections for gra to gravity, and uh, as uh, hopefully as we go along in the talk, we'll see a few of those and uh, how tantalizing has it been uh, that connection and uh, how it has uh, motivated uh, multiple directions. And I'll try to describe some of those. So in the context of general activity, so I'm going to start very far from uh, fluids in, 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 at first sight. Well, general activity is this theory that we have had uh, for uh, over a hundred years. And uh, however successful it has been, it has proven, um, and so far it keeps uh, uh, doing so, um, it still is the case that it's a rather enigmatic theory. Um, there is little that we know in the more, as far as the general behavior of such a theory. Uh, it's a complicated. It's it's ruled by a complicated set of equations, and uh, we know of very important solutions have been understood uh, primarily from a geometrical point of view. Um, and then we, as we go along and try to understand the the dynamical implications of the theory, we have some tools. I'll describe some, and we have of course been learning more and more on this uh, nonlinear behavior through simulations. But we're still missing, uh, arguably. Uh, a fundamental understanding, uh, especially in the regime uh, of where nonlinearities are are important. So I'll, I'll try and say and, and how this connection with with um, the understanding of hydrodynamics and turbulence, at the very least, motivates thinking in in a different light. Uh, and of course, hydrodynamics has been this theory that for a very long time one has had to face the nonlinear richness of the theory, uh, and so. I, I would argue that uh, the understanding of gravity itself has much to learn uh, from that point of view of how, how to uh, try and comprehend a very complicated nonlinear uh, theory um, and, and what tools should one try and bring into, into the fray. But I'm gonna start with some very simple observations um, and kind of historically moving forward in time. Uh, so we understand black holes are rather simple, they are clean, uh, we say they are they are bald or arguably have two hairs, so so just mass and spin, and their linear response is rather straightforward. And I'll I'll describe a little bit of, of that. But I mean, in the uh, close to the turn of the century, this um, their role the role of black holes as potential CFT calculations through holography has come to the front, and that has kind of motivated, in particular, this thing called fluid gravity correspondence. Uh, some uh, the, the, some of the main players actually are are in India, um, and this has motivated some of the results I'll, or the discussions I'll I'll, I'll discuss. Um, so, starting with this observation that black holes are simple and their dyna dynamics are simple, this goes back to just understanding uh, how linearized perturbations over a black hole background behave, and and. If you postulate that the metric, say, is the metric of a curve solution or a short solution, and you try and sort for linear for linear perturbations of them, you uncover this uh, these things which people call quasi normal quasi normal modes, which essentially are describing uh, an exponential and uh, oscillation oscillatory decay towards equilibrium, where the real and imaginary part, the real describing the oscillations and the imaginary part, the decay rate are intimately tied to the mass and spin, say, of a, of a curved black hole. Um, of course, this observation has been tremendously influential. Uh, it has underpinned the, the belief that black holes are stable. It has uh, led to many interesting results in mathematics. And they are the use of black hole as building blocks to try and understand some, some of the most energetic events that we see in the universe. 
at the foundational point of view, uh, in the 80s, people were trying to motivate uh, a better or deeper understanding of the equations by kind of trying to map these equations to things that people are more familiar with, either hydrodynamics and electrodynamics. And this came under the umbrella of the so-called membrane paradigm that was initiated by Thibaut Amour and then taken and pushed significantly forward by, by Thorne Price and McDonald's in the, in the 80s. Um, but of course, now we have a, an amazing tool or an amazing opportunity, which is uh, these gravitational wave detectors. And I'm very happy to, to hear that uh, construction has begun in the LIGO India uh, in, uh, site. So hopefully uh, that detector in the future will be uh, coming into the network and being instrumental to understand the systems, localize and, and do wonderful science. But if, I mean, uh, before being able to kind of understand what the binary black hole collision and the gravitational waves that are produced uh, as a consequence, look, uh, I mean, Keith Thorne would go around showing this kind, this plot is a, a plot taken by Keith, where of course he was being provocative as to the needs and opportunity uh, that will come to the front when once we have a gravitational wave detector. As well, early on, we understand more or less what the system will be doing because this will be kind of describable in terms of positionary expansions. At very late times, where well, we could use this ring down of by quasi modes, but what happens in the middle? Well, is this, maybe this is very complicated uh, nonlinear phenomena will show up. Eventually, and starting with the work by Franz Vittorius in 2005, we were able to solve this problem, and now we do that routinely. And this complicated picture turns out to be not complicated at all. Right? Forget about this early stuff, which is due to the initial uh, initial data chosen. But as you look at the waveform, well, you have a sinusoidal waveform where the frequency is sweeping to higher frequencies rather smoothly, uh, similarly with the amplitude. And then at some point, the merger takes place. And if I zoom in the merger, this is what you see. So, Again, the, the same trend continues. The frequency goes up, the amplitude goes up. At some point, a single black hole forms or the black holes merge, and then you have this, this decay. So arguably, the problem is rather simple looking. And this is, in some sense, you could say there's a puzzle here. How is it that, I mean, uh, an, an earnest, the most nonlinear regime that we can think of the theory, uh, short of the Big Bang, is showing such a very simplistic behavior? So I'm going to just pause there and leave this uh, kind of as a, as, a, as a potential thing that we'll connect with uh, later on. So, but it's essentially what we want to know is that, well, is gravity, even in this most complex regime, uh, going to behave so simple? And if so, or how are it's going to uh, behave, can we understand from fundamental kind of angles what to expect? And there is where, well, given that we have a theory that is highly, highly uh, uh, non-standard, what, la what lampposts or where do we know uh, of things we can learn from to try and at least ask some relevant questions in the context of gravity? And this is where this kind of holography comes to the front or comes into the game. Uh, so uh, this conjecture that there is this duality between the behavior of gravity with a negative cosmological constant and a conformal fee theory that lives on the boundary has multiple consequences, has been used and exploited in many, in many corners. But in particular, it motivated people thinking, well, even in a CFT, if we iterate or uh, within some, that some sc the length scales of the system, we know that CFTs can be written in terms of hydrodynamics. Then there has to be a connection between uh, gravity in uh, uh, ADS and hydrodynamics. Uh, and people indeed went looking for it and, and found it in, a, in a, a spectacular fashion. What you find is, and I'll say a little bit more in a bit, that gravity uh, perturbations of black hole in the interior of the space-time mapped uh, at the boundary of the space-time to relativistic hydrodynamics. And people carried out this program all the way to second order hydrodynamics, getting uh, a one-to-one -one match with the expectations from just uh, pure theoretical ex expectations. And what you were doing there is just simply, in some sense, recasting the behavior of perturbations on the gravi gravitational sector and realizing that on a one-dimensional lower uh, boundary, uh, what you got is uh, relativistic hydrodynamics. 
So, I mean, this, the details are much more nuanced than what I'm going to describe, but just, just as a simple kind of uh, picture, imagine, again, the curve solution. Well, it's a curve in ADS, but it's a curve solution. And imagine that you promote the mass and the spin to slowly varying functions of the coordinate. And then you ask for a perturbative approach, which is very different from the standard one in, in general relativity uh, that people use it. Here, uh, the perturbation is on the gradient of, of this kind of mass and spin that will be constant for a stationary solution, but it, in a dynamical solution, they are promoted to functions. The assumption is built in that the gradient expansion is true, that higher order gradients are subleading to lower order gradients. And when you put that into answer the questions, you find a hierarchy uh, that is the, in reality in the uh, boundary of anti sitter you have precisely the conservation laws of a, an effective uh, stress area tensor, which is a viscous stress area tensor, which has a particular equation of state. You can compute the transport coefficient, and everything follows in a very natural way. But then, then this comes and, and brings or begs the question: if, if this comes in such a nat natural way, well, everything that we know from say relativistic aerodynamics should also be or have a counterpart in gravity, in particular turbulence. Um, and of course, that was an interesting question that we set up ourselves and others to, to ponder, because for a long time, uh, people in the gravitational camp had thought that, well, there shouldn't be turbulence in gravity. And the arguments came from multiple directions. One is, well, in perturbation theory, look, you have decaying uh, modes. There is nothing interesting there. So this doesn't look or doesn't smell like uh, turbulence. We also, or people, as people solved numerically this, the, the equations of motion and collided black holes, you never saw energy cascading to, towards the UV. Uh, and the typical figure that people had in mind with turbulence that is a standard kind of turbulence in three plus one dimensions where you create eddies and those eddies uh, break into smaller eddies and this thing keeps going. You never saw that in the simulations. And then there was this other argument that, well, hydrodynamics has uh, equations that naturally rise to shocks, but general activity will not give shocks unless you put them by hand. And so, well, one, one theory has these equations that have this natural uh, uh, occurrence. The R1 cannot have those occurrence. Well, maybe turbulence is something that belongs to the corner of hydrodynamics. It doesn't belong to general activity. On the other hand, you could push, well, no, it should, because this ADS-CFT correspondence that motivates the fluid gravity correspondence is applicable once you look at this gradient expansion, precisely in a regime that you can identify has a very high Reynolds number. Uh, and so this pushes in the opposite direction. And just as a, as a, a connection, if you haven't looked into this uh, uh, at all, well, I mean, you, you also have a dictionary uh, in this fluid gravity correspondence as well. What you uh, interpret as viscosity on the fluid side, it's seen on the gravitational side as loss of energy through the horizon. A system in hydrodynamics that wants to thermalize and wants to reach equilibrium on the gravitational side is a black hole that's, that is decaying away to quiescent state. And so then this list of questions come to the front again. So how do we reconcile the potential existence with turbulence with this quasi normal mode expectation. And if there is turbulence, what is the analog to uh, a, gravity, uh, a Reynolds number in gravity? Um, so again, I mean, the definition of turbulence, many people have uh, their pref the pre preferred one. Mine is going to be very simple-minded. I'm going to call turbulent a regime where I will, I, one would be able to identify a cascade of energy one way or another that there might be a particular uh, quantity that one can define uh, is a Reynolds number above which these nonlinear interactions are very relevant, below which one has kind of a very linear behavior, kind of the, the laminar versus turbulent regime. And there are correlations that one can kind of identify and, and compute explicitly. So this is uh, a fun uh, movie and I'll show you. And as, as this movie goes, I'll tell you what it is. This is going, using the fluid gravity correspondence, looking at that fluid that behaves, uh, uh, that is determined at the boundary of ADS and just computing what is that fluid doing? So it's, is this fluid behaving turbulently? 
And indeed, this is what you see. You have an initial set of uh, perturbation, and as time goes by, it generates these vortices. These vortices merge because one is thinking of a black hole in, that is perturbed in three plus one dimensions. The boundary theory is one lower dimensions, two plus one, and their turbulence is uh, primarily cascades energy towards the IR, not to the UV. And this is precisely what one is seeing. So this is the fluid that is the dual to the gravitational perturbation of a black hole. And we're looking there just how the fluid behaves. Um, and quite interestingly, at about the same time, uh, Paul, uh, 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 Paul Chesler and collaborators were studying precisely that problem, the three plus one uh, setup of uh, gravity uh, in anti deciter with a black hole perturbed. And we kind of communicated, they chose the consistent same initial data. And as they evolve, the picture on the left is the gravitational behavior, uh, how it looks on the boundary. And the picture on the right is what the fluid gravity correspondence would be telling you uh, the, the, the boundary be uh, behavior should be. And so then you see this match, which had to be there because the fluid gravity uh, fluid uh, gravity correspondence told that they should be so. So then you say, well, what now that you are kind of going more towards the gravity, we're slowly going to start ignoring a little bit, uh, thinking too much on the hydro, but trying to see what is going on on the gravitational side. What's the dual description on the uh, on the gravitational point of view of things that we know and and love about understanding. Uh, turbulence in, in hydrodynamics. So in particular, vorticity. Vorticity plays a key role in, in many of these studies, especially uh, in trying to understand which direction energy would cascade. And so different people have been trying or tried in the past to identify where is vorticity encoded in terms of natural quantities uh, on the gravitational side. For instance, the Pontryagin density has a vorticity square. The imaginary part of uh, one particular set of components of the bile tensor also has it, um, but many of the components have it. Uh, but the structure of this vortex, this vortex at infinity, so these things that are living at infinity, and you ask what is going on in the bulk? Well, in the bulk, what's going on is you have this structure that extends all the way from the boundary towards the horizon. So essentially what this gravitational uh, this nonlinearity has done with initial perturbation is to create this effective geon-like structures where you have this kind of gravitational wave that is sufficiently self-gravitating to keep itself kind of cohesive for a long time as it decays very slowly with gravitational leaking, waves leaking into the horizon. Um, of course, the quantity that is really governing the inverse cascade is this quantity or it's the behavior of this quantity called entropy, which has to do with the square of the vorticity iterated over the, over the, over the volume. And the, there is ongoing work that uh, still hasn't uh, bear its, uh, its ultimate solution of what's the gravity, what would be the, the sense uh, uh, of the, in, in which gravi a gravitational entropy could be defined and what the consequences are. But let's just take these and keep pressing on to see what else we can say. So just as a as a as a dual or as as a nano, uh, as a different uh, example, here what I'm showing is in the top left is a Schwarzschild black hole that has been perturbed, and the bottom right is a curved black hole that has been perturbed. Of course, in order to cover a sphere, uh, we need multiple patches. So these are six patches that cover. So this uh, top here is the North Pole. This is the South Pole, and then we have four patches uh, kind of on the equatorial region. And we're just simply seeing what happens as time goes by with these perturbations. And very much like in the previous case, which was a planar black hole, you see that eddies form, they tend to merge, they tend to propagate, especially in the Kerr case, because there is a net rotation of the space time. And then you end up with kind of two blobs, one at the North Pole and one at the South Pole in the Kerr black hole. And in the Schwarzschild case, you end up with four and very slowly they're kind of either approach into each other and eventually would probably just dissipate away. And so we'll come back to this in the context of gravity in a minute. So, but again, what I'm stressing here is that I'm looking at the fluid uh, theory that lives on the boundary of ADS, that is the dual to the perturbed black hole. 
So having this solution, one can recover the full black hole solution in the, in, in the bulk of the space time and check that indeed it's a, a very good approximation to the solution uh, of such a perturbation in of a black hole. And again, this is something that we knew because the fluid gravity correspondence had been, had been established. We're just trying to see how, whether indeed this turbulence behavior uh, is such that is combining things as expected from kind of an Navier uh, Stokes point of view, but we're actually doing in the relativistic hydrodynamic case, and and then just trying to see to what extent the, our intuition in the Navier Stokes case is carrying over to a relativistic case, and indeed everything is playing out the way one one expects. As a side comment, and this is something more uh, newer, I would say that there is many connections, hydrodynamic connections in, hidden in gravity, if one knows or one looks in different in, in different places. So the one I'm describing here is the, re, the connection with relativistic hydrodynamics, which is the projection of Einstein equations onto the time-like boundary of anti Sitter. But instead of choosing that projection, projection, one chooses the projection onto the acceler an accelerated time-like surface and the bulk, one can find that there is a connection with Navier-Stokes. And instead of doing that projection, one chooses to do the projection onto a null surface, in particular, the null surface describing the horizon, one finds out that the equations of motion correspond to Carolian hydrodynamics. And this is uh, something that is relatively new and people are beginning to uh, play with this correspondence and then trying to see to what extent uh, new lessons can be learned. But for the purpose of this talk, we're just going to stay here on the uh, thinking of the boundary of ADS and eventually try to move away from it. So um, the observation so far is that indeed uh, the inverse cascade, as long as one is studying uh, three plus one black holes, is moving energy towards longer wavelengths. Um, and so then, well, one can speculate that four plus one gravity wants to accelerate much, much faster than three plus one gravity because in one case, energy would want to flow to the UV and the UV will be much more rapidly dissipated than longer wavelengths. In the language of uh, black hole perturbations, if this nonlinear interactions is moving energies into this quasi almost high, of higher uh, uh, angular momenta, and those have quasi normal decays rates, this uh, imaginary part of the omega that I showed early on, has a much faster decay to zero than uh, the lower, the longer wavelengths. Um, and so it, you could imagine that three plus one gravitational interactions versus four plus one gravitational interactions would behave quite differently just because of this correspondence or this connection with the hydro behavior. Um, but, and of course, more in, more in general, uh, this idea that one can try and understand hydro from a geometrical point of view, understanding deeper or, uh, or, or using the tools of gravity to shed different lights on question, on long-standing hydrodynamic questions has been a, a very tantalizing uh, and, and fruitful kind of, at least motivating questions. And people like Austin, and Rabinovich and other, other uh, have, have, uh, push significantly in that direction. I, I want to go in a different direction. I want to keep kind of motivated by the hydrodynamic observations to try and find out uh, different ways to understand gravity uh, in its own right, and especially what, else, what lessons can we draw uh, in the gravitational side uh, about nonlinear behavior by following a little bit uh, the, the lessons from, um, from hydrodynamics. So the first thing was, would be, well, now that we have somehow established that indeed nonlinear phenomena exist, uh, that the connection through the fluid gravity correspondence tells us that, tells us that it, it has all the hallmarks and, or, 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 or ingredients of what we know as building blocks or, or particular phenomena in, in hydrodynamics. Well, we now need to at least uh, some of us would like to understand, re-understand some, some of that phenomena from a purely gravitational point of view. So what we're gonna do is motivated by the observations from hydrodynamics, try and, and find out what's the right calculation we can do and what regime would be the ideal regime to try and understand or 
see bring to the front these nonlinear interactions. So in particular, uh, one, could, one would say, well, maybe if you study black holes in the right regime, this would happen. But of course, we don't live in ADS. We also would like to eventually make contact with gravitational waves observations. So the, first, the very first thing we're gonna do is to throw away the uh, cosmological constant. We're gonna consider asymptotically flat space times. One immediately might say, well, careful, because the fluid gravity correspondence has been established in the context of uh, anti the sitter. Um, but that one, one could push back saying, well, maybe that just changes things ever so slightly as far as time scales, but also more, more to the point, from the point of view of, of the partial differential equations of, uh, of the theory of Einstein's equations with or without a cosmological constant, the cosmological constant is really not changing anything as far as the nonlinear interaction. It's just lambda GAB in the right hand side. So who cares? So motivated by that, we come and try and do uh, an analysis in a regime uh, of black holes in asymptotic flat space time. Of course, what we're gonna try and do is stack the odds in our favor. We know that in the context of hydro, hydro the larger the viscosity, the less chances there are for uh, turbulence to actually be very relevant. And so what we're gonna say is, well, if it is the case that hydrodynamic viscosity is dual or it's related to the effective decay of the uh, linear modes uh, of black hole perturbations in some sense, well, we can always look for a black hole that will decay in the slowest possible way. And those are black holes uh, that are highly spinning. So highly spinning black holes decay much, much more slowly than uh, non-spinning black holes or slowly spinning black holes. So just as a, as a reminder, uh, and because is that, that's gonna be the punchline, if we think of a parametric oscillator, uh, kind of described by this equation, where there is a frequency, the natural frequency of the oscillator, but multiplied by a, a function that might depend on time, depending on the natural frequency of this function that depends on time, there could be this parametric interaction and some specific modes, uh, if this function has have them, might grow exponentially out of taking energy away from the kind of oscillatory, the natural oscillation of, of the oscillator. And this, this, so this parametric instability is something that we're gonna be looking for. Uh, and so the, the calculation, I mean, it's, it's, it's a detail, it's a detailed uh, calculation. I, I will not go into the details, but basically the observation is the following. Consider a black hole perturbed by a given mode. What that has as a consequence is now this, the effective space time is a space time that is slowly kind of oscillating with that, that mode. So then we're gonna throw in a second mode and then ask the question, how is this mode going to behave when it moves over the now time dependence uh, space time, uh, which is varying, as I said, because of the presence of the first mode. And once you look at that, well, the equations of motion are the equations of motion for the say this a scalar field. Uh, it's this equation of motion on on a space time where the op, the Dalambertian operator has a piece that is just the piece corresponding to the Dalambertian of the fixed Kerr black hole. But then there is another contribution that is time dependent due to the first mode that was there. And if you analyze the equations, you realize that indeed there is a possibility of parametric instability if it just so happens that this term is sufficiently larger than that term. Again, I'm, I'm not gonna go into details. I'm happy to, to answer uh, the questions on that. But you can see that, well, you, what you like to do is make this alpha positive for an exponential to take place. And that's gonna be there provided this thing is larger than that thing where one of the omegas is the omega of kind of the space and that oscillates and the R omega is the omega of the scalar field. And so you can make them, you can make the thing that works against you zero by having a two to one relation. And you're trying to make this one the largest. And so if you imagine that this, indeed this goes away, you can then begin to put things or evaluate this, this quantity. And this quantity, I'm gonna jump uh, to the conclusion, is nothing but- the minutes. Yes, okay, it's nothing but this con combination, it's a combination of the amplitude of the first mode divided by the azimuthal number of that mode and the 
effective decay rate of that mode. And then you can just naturally relate it. Well, okay, the amplitude of the oscillation, well, that's like the velocity in the fluid case. The one over the azimuthal number is like the wavelength. And the decay rate is like essentially the viscosity over the density. And, and you replace that and you, what you get is exactly what you would have called uh, a, gravity, uh, a Reynolds number. So this combination is tells us that indeed this parametric instability will happen. The net effect of that will be that some modes will grow for a little bit exponentially, and then they will decay. So what you have is uh, essentially uh, what is uh, the, what we know in hydrodynamics as decaying turbulence. And this can have observable consequences. If you don't know that this, this phenomenon is there, you may be expecting that a late time, a black hole is de uh, decaying to equilibrium by just, if you were thinking of the laminar regime and this is the structure, you would expect that this structure is there all the time and slowly decaying away. But in reality, this energy exchange between modes, you can have a much richer structure. And this is very relevant because we go and get the data and you, and you get kind of a, a collection of modes that you didn't expect, you might uh, fool yourself thinking that um, uh, general, general activity is failing to describe this situation when it's precisely doing exactly what you would, what the theory wants to do, which is in the right regime, nonlinear interactions will move energy uh, from one into another one. Um, so uh, as, a, as a little bit of a kind of a crazy uh, or, or or provocative uh, st statement, we can come back to our per, our our, our, um, our gravitational wave picture, and our question as to why is it so simple? Well, I mean, motivated or strongly influenced by this uh, fluid correspondence, when we say, well, maybe this it had no other choice, another chance to be this simple, because in reality, three plus one gravity is acting in disguise uh, in, in many ways as related to two plus one hydrodynamics. And two plus one hydrodynamics is significantly simpler. It doesn't want to cascade into very high short wavelength features. It wants to maintain those or go to longer ones. And so maybe this is what uh, all along general activity had in store and we hadn't been able to, uh, to appreciate this. And of course, in order to do that, we should be able to try and understand what is the analog to the centropy, how does it come about, what's the right structure in gravity to identify it, and how to understand the connection between the way nonlinear interactions will go, will behave, and how energy will cascade one way or another. So I'm just reaching the end. Uh, I think this is, is a very fruitful, at least to me, has been tremendously I mean, motivating to look at different things from time to time. Uh, there are others that are looking at uh, very different uh, or different aspects of this connection. But I mean, this, this, um, this idea that black holes uh, have in store a lot of things that we know from hydrodynamics, and not only can they, can one use that connection to motivate new ideas in gravity, but potentially once they are understood in gravity, use uh, a kind of at least a different terminology and a different intuition to bring it back to the context of of, of fluid might be a, a, a very useful exercise. And it will conclude with just showing two different movies. So the movie in the right, in the right is a black hole in higher dimensions that have been perturbed. Uh, this instability just shrinks the black hole in different regions and, uh, and elongates in, the op, in, in an extra dimension. And then it has this fractal structure, uh, this instability uh, induces this fractal structure of the horizon till eventually thing down to zero. And the left-hand side, it's a movie, it's a very interesting movie uh, about uh, uh, a Rayleigh plateau instability of, of saliva. And uh, I mean, there is significant um, uh, kind of uh, similarities to make this at least uh, tantalizing to keep exploring. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? Hello. Yeah. Uh, if you could go back to the simulation you were showing for the Kerr and Schwarzschild black hole. Yes. Uh, I believe that was in ADS, right? Yes. Uh, so if you ran similar simulations in flat space, uh, asymptotically flat, uh, Kerr and Schwarzschild, would you sim see similar patterns? Have, have so, people seen similar patterns? 
Yes. So, uh, and the, so the, I I went too quickly on that. So, oops. so hold on, let me see. These ones, the previous one, that simulation is uh, a boosted black, a uh, boosted planar black hole. So there's no no spin here. You just boost it. That gives you the background velocity of your fluid, and then you perturb the fluid velocity a little bit. These are small ripples on that background fluid, and then this evolution is what. Uh, what ensues uh, as time goes on. Uh, yeah, but that is an ADS, right? That's in ADS. Yeah, I'm, I'm just asking, is there a similar simulation for a flat space black hole where you just oh, take you mean, a structural black hole and put a, the horizon? You mean an asymptotic flat space? Yeah, asymptotic flat space, yeah. Because yeah, I, yeah. So, I, right. So there, the thing is that, and this is where it becomes a little bit delicate, but quite interesting and challenging at the same time. So there are plenty of these simulations but the correspondence is not as clean. So you have a very clean uh, correspondence of uh, between gravity and relativistic aerodynamics on the boundary of ADS. Now, and this has to do with this uh, plot I put in here, which is one issue to try and do it in asymptotic flat space time. So if you're not in, in ADS, so imagine you forget about this one. So you could try and, and say, well, I know that there are, uh, you can induce or, or relate your gravitational uh, equations to Navier-Stokes on a uh, on a time-like surface at the interior. The problem there is what you call physics and what someone else might call gauge becomes highly dependent because I mean you can define this surface and someone else can define a surface with a wiggle, and the the identification of what's physical and what's gauge becomes problematic. This is why, in particular, some of us are uh, a little bit excited, or there are some excited at least uh, trying to do in the on the Carolin hydrodynamic on the on the null surface, which gives you Carolin hydro, because at least that surface is a unique surface. And there is also very recent work where people have done the the same thing on asymptotic flats uh, null uh, sky. There you also identify a Carolin structure of, uh, that is related to hydrodynamics. So maybe that's the right way of doing it. So people nowadays routinely, of course, collide black holes or study black holes that are rotating or, 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 or not with perturbations. But the identification with the, with the fluid is still lacking because of these ambiguities. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, um... I really don't uh, know this stuff, but I just have curiosity. So this fluid flows, can it be observed on the Schwarzschild surface? I mean, can you make a connection with the real black hole with the Schwarzschild radius? Some activity out there, it should be quite turbulent. I hope well, my question is clear. No, yeah, I, th I think I think I understand your, your question. So, um, so there are different things one can say. Well, some people have studied like, numerical simulations, people have gone and tried to look on the horizon itself, what structure you, did you see? And there are different things that you could try and look for. Um, and there is some, I think I would say there is some going work on that. There is also work, uh, the type of work I, I mentioned where you kind of, you try and study second order perturbations of black hole and then try to identify phenomena that you can relate to the behavior you expect in hydrodynamics. But ultimately, and this relates to that crazy idea I, I, I mentioned, well, the simplicity of waveforms in some senses has that message hidden, that the nonlinearities did act, but they, act in they acted in such a way that energy did not want to flow into the UV. So hidden in these, it might very well be that message. And we have yet to understand how to how to uh, at least explore this question in 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 much more depth than just this kind of maybe tantalizing or provocative suggestion. So I have one question. So to get an inverse cascade in two D Navier Stokes, you need to conserve quantities in the implicit limit. So then, do you have? to conserve quantities in, in, the, in the gravitational theory? Yeah, so in the gravitational theory, um, there is, so there should be this entropy thing. So one indeed can find uh, a conserved quantity uh, in the inviscid case. So, and of course, 
in the gravitational case, because energy is always being lost into the horizon, at least, uh, it's you always will lose some energy. But if you take the, the limit of the black hole being extremely large, then, then the effective viscosity keeps going smaller and smaller. So you can see that there is a there is a current there that is conserved, or there's a quantity there that is conserved. That uh, and this is a work that we've done in uh, like in 2015 or 16 with Carrasco, Myers, uh, Reula, myself, and and uh, on Ajit Singh. Sing. Um, the but I I still. But this is on the hydro side. So you, what you do is you use the fluid gra gra gravity correspondent, you understand what it is in the hydro side, and then you identify that kind of quantity that is conserved. What we're still lacking for in my taste is a better understanding just from geometrical terms. And this is what this, all these works are trying to do. They're trying to identify where that information is of that quantity that you know is conserved at the second or well, at, at, on the hydrodynamic side, and if you kind of dial the viscosity to zero, you see that it's conserved. But then I think we are, I mean, I, I would argue that we are at a rather unsatisfactory level of the understanding of what is the dual quantity on the gravitational sector that, that and how to understand it. Okay, let's thank the speaker once again. Thank you.